Hello, everybody. Welcome to PNB is Listening. My name is Phil Chan. I'm the co-founder of Final Bow for Yellowface, and I'm so excited to have two Quarter Valley members from Pacific Northwest Valley joining us tonight, Yuki Takahashi and Christopher DiAriano. Welcome. Uh, today, this conversation is uh, around the Asian experience in classical ballet, something that we don't often uh, shine a spotlight on. So we wanted to hear from two dancers in the company uh, that have gone through the system and become professional dancers and hear about both their successes and potential barriers that they faced as Asian Americans in this field uh, to hopefully um, make our dance form more equitable and make this a more welcoming place for other Asian Americans. So welcome guys. Thank you. Uh, first wanted to start the conversation with hearing more about your personal stories. Um, would love to hear where you're from um, and kind of what brought you into dance. So Yuki, would love to hear your personal story. Sure. So I was born in Tokyo, Japan. Um, moved to the States when I was three years old and that's when I started ballet. My mom just kind of threw me into classes um, she was like, do you want to start ballet maybe? And I was like, yeah. And so I didn't really um, think much of it, but um, continued dancing my whole life up until maybe 12. I was like, I hit a point where I was going to take it seriously. So um, moved to New York for high school and then trained there. And then I auditioned for the PMB summer course. And that led me to being here in Seattle. Great. And Christopher? I grew up in New York City. Um, I started with competition dance when I was about six years old. Um, a family friend, close family friend, kind of just dragged me to a gymnastics class. And then from there, I wound up doing hip hop and tap and jazz and the whole shebang. And then I went to a school called Ballet Tech um, in New York City in Manhattan, run by Elliot Feld, and got exposed more closely to ballet. And then after I graduated middle school, I went to School of American Ballet for four years and really focused on, you know, ballet and neoclassical ballet. And then came to Pacific Northwest Ballet as an apprentice um, a year after training in that school as well. So. Great, and would love to hear uh, more about your uh, Asian identity. Uh, how, do, how do you identify and uh, how has your Asian-ness informed your dance career up until this point? Uh, Yuki. Um, I, def I identify myself as fully Japanese. I'm very connected to my culture, um, but at the same time, I pretty much grew up in America, so also very Americanized. I'm like, I feel very in between to both extremes. So if that, it's like a confusing place to be, but um, heavily Japanese, but also heavily American. And you, Christopher? So I'm Chinese and Italian. My mother's full Chinese, and I grew up in a family Chinese restaurant, so I'm very close with my um, Chinese family, my cousins, my aunts, everybody there. Um, so I identify as a HAPA, you know, half Asian, half white. And again, very Americanized because I grew up in New York City, full of lots of uh, different types of people and diversity and yeah. And so I guess w what I'd love to explore is um, your pathways to PNB and how uh, your Asian-ness has sort of led you on this current path. So I guess I'm curious, uh, maybe Yuki, you can sh share a little bit more about your experience um, in school and uh, maybe at what point did you realize that you were maybe the only Asian in the room or that it was maybe something that made you a little bit different than some of your other peers at the time? Yeah, um, when I was a student, um, I went to a very small studio in Texas when I started off and I didn't feel any different because I had a community of other Japanese students that I also went to Japanese school on Saturdays and then we also went to ballet together. And so I had that community, sense of community there. 
so I don't think I ever really noticed anything where I was a minority. And then also in New York, I there's so many different people there and I was so focused on dancing that I don't think, I was just trying to get by. And then um, when I got to PMB, I did have a moment in one variations class maybe. And I just kind of looked around the room and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm different, you know? And um, that was weird to me, but at the same time, I had people in the company that I could look up to. So it gave me some hope to, it kind of reassured me that I would be able to do, become a professional dancer. It really like helped a lot to be able to look up to dancers. Now, uh, you, you were sharing when we spoke earlier um, about becoming a US citizen and sort of how that mentality has shaped your dancing and your approach to artistry. Could you maybe share um, kind of your experience with that and, and how that gave you some extra drive to be successful as a dancer here in America? Yes, um, I was always um, here on visa, under my parents' visa ever since I got here. But once I turned 18, I had to establish my own. And so, for me, that was, I think it would have been, it might've been a student visa at first because I was still a professional division student um, here. But then once I got into the company, um, I started the process or I was finally got towards the end of my green card process. And um, that caused me to like miss certain rehearsals and, you know, not be able to be, in some performances and it it definitely felt like I was different just because I had to go that extra effort to establish a place here as you know a non-citizen so um but it definitely made me work harder um because I have that desire to be here I want to prove that I am able to be here you know so that definitely gave me that sense of like drive and extra work to put in for sure. It's very rewarding to be able to be here and dance. And did you, did you ever feel like um, because you were an immigrant, you might've had to work harder to prove that you had a spot in the room or that there was um, maybe an unspoken pressure that you were putting on yourself uh, in order to justify why you're in this space? Absolutely. Um, my dad would always tell me from a young age that I am different. He would always ingrain that in me. You're not a citizen, so you may or may not get treated a little bit differently. There are certain rules and, that we have to go through, and it's not easy to hear as a child, but I think it gave me some grit for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> do, do you think that... Um maybe like did you feel like you had to work harder than your other peers to just prove that you belonged or to, to stand out in any way i did i did feel that way because it's like you feel replaceable kind of because it's like you're it, it costs extra money for a company to have someone pay for their visa and whatnot and it's like why would a company do that for someone if they're not exceptional? You know, it's like kind of that mindset of like, you kind of have to be worth it and kind of prove yourself because of that extra step that's there. And that was definitely hard as a student. And has that feeling sort of subsided as you've joined the company and kind of uh, been more secure about your place and also you know, arriving as an American, has that changed your mentality at all in your work? I think once I got my green card, it felt a lot more pertinent. It was like, like I'm, I wanna work towards getting my citizenship and it will be easier now because I have a green card, but it definitely was a huge weight off my shoulders. Um, I don't focus too much on it. And I think if I continue to view myself as, oh, I'm so different, 
and put myself down in that way, it doesn't help in the end. So yeah. I'm trying to be optimistic about the fact that I am here and that I should be grateful for that. And, you know, just a different way to look at it, I think. Yeah. And Christopher would love to hear um, your experience about um, your training and your education and um, how did your uh, experience uh, with your Asian-ness affect how you progressed through school and, and um, how you absorbed the information of, of the, the, from your teachers? So I feel very similarly as Yuki, um, kind of growing up, I was never really surrounded by Asian classmates in the dance studio um, or even at school really. So growing up, I never thought of me as being different. I just thought I was there, I was doing my work, you know, I was learning and I was very hyper-focused, I think. Um, as a ballet dancer, when you're training, it's all about discipline. And I think I was just disciplining myself to be present and be open and continue learning. But when I went to um, School of American Ballet, I was one of, I think, three Asian people in the entire division. and then I started noticing as I was getting a bit older in the school that I was I was not the same as other people. I didn't look the same. And in my mind, I was like, okay, I have nobody to really look up to. I have nobody to really converse about this. And it kind of led me to think, what if I could be that person? What if I could be that role model that graduates and goes to a major company and, you know, is doing it, is doing the, the dream and doing the thing. Um, I never really had any Asian teachers growing up, dance teachers, so I never got to learn firsthand their experience. Um, I would go to senior York City ballet shows a lot and there were not very many uh, Asian dancers on stage. So for me, it was more of like an opportunity. I tried to be more optimistic and be like, I could do this. I could be a person out there that's representing my story and my culture and you know, my mom's side of things, my dad's side of things, what it's like to be a biracial American and New Yorker. And then I kind of was led to PNB and I saw again, those role models now, you know, we have uh, more than two handful uh, amounts of dancers that are Asian here. And I started, something clicked and I was like, oh wow, like there are people that have a similar journey as me with their heritage and their family and where they've been and I can see it through their dance. I can relate with that on a deeper level. So coming to PNB kind of opened my eyes a lot. It let me see that I'm here and it's not anything to be passive about. You know, I can celebrate who I am on stage with my friends, with my peers, and people understand that. And it's not something that we avoid. Um, so yeah, I think my journey, was it started off kind of blindly um, as being an Asian in the room. And then I'm discovering what that's worth now and how much I can give to my community um, because the platform I have now, which is, I think Yuki and I feel very similarly. We talk about that a lot, how um, there's kind of a passive tone in the Asian culture in America. And we both, are not very passive people. You know, we are ambitious, we want to do things, we're disciplined. So it's, yeah, we, we made it this far. And I think having these conversations starting now, it's it's only giving us more perspective too as to how we can help our community. Well, first of all, I just wanted to highlight the, the dynamic of this conversation. Um, really, I think it, it takes a lot of courage for both PNB as an institution, as well as you two as individuals, to have this open and honest conversation. So I really want to make sure our audience appreciates that. Um, there is this power imbalance when you're a student um, and th there's teachers in front of the room who are making decisions or an artistic director at the front of the room who has full control over your career, your casting, you know, whether or not you get to dance. So uh, it can sometimes be hard for dancers to be honest and open with their experience and how they're feeling. Um, so first of all, just wanted to give a shout out to PNB for even making the space for this conversation to really listen uh, to your experiences, but also for the two of you to step up. You know, you're both 
young, ambitious core dancers who want to get promoted, who want those roles. So it it can be a little scary to stick your neck out and um, and talk about these issues. So really wanted our audience to appreciate this this dynamic that we're really trying to to highlight. But um, back to this idea of role models and having people that look like you. Um, Yuki, I would just love to hear um, kind of why that is important to you and how you think you can play a role in being a role model for the next generation of Asian American dancers. I think with being Asian, it's you're far from being blonde. You're far from... I think that, oops. No. Sorry, I don't know what just happened. Nope. You're all good. We can start. Okay. Um. Anyways, you're the way you look is you're you're when you're when you're full Asian, you're full Asian. You know, it's like you will stand out. Um. And I think it's important to have people that you can relate to, even in looks, is because it just like. It just gives you a little bit of hope. I think. I think with Asians too, um, we typically have longer torsos and it's not, you know, very typical cookie cutter, like ballerina body. And for me, that was really important to me to be able to see dancers that are proportionally kind of like me. And I, it gave me hope to see that and it inspired me and kept me moving forward, I think. Um, like, and I like another place. do want to be that for younger dancers too. Like, I'll own the fact that you know I have short legs, or you know what I mean. Like, it's um especially because ballet is so used to be so cookie cutter. I think it is getting better, but yeah, I think I would like to be that for younger dancers too. Yeah. What about you, Christopher? It's so important to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, my role models growing up weren't necessarily people. I think it, for me, it was more of like an idea that I could do more or I could do something great. I could do something better and reach a dream. And as I got older, you kind of, society reflects the best people they deem. And a lot of those people are never really Asian in the ballet world, at least the one that I grew up in. Um, so I, I think it's extremely important now to be a role model for those, you know, biracial students, to be a role model for um, Chinese students, for Asian students that are from America. I don't know, I think as much representation as we can expose, the healthier our culture could be as uh, ballet dancers, as people in a society, in American society, in a democracy. So I think just highlighting people and showing that we're here, we're doing our thing, you know, and nothing's gonna stop us just because of my hair is darker than the other person, or like you, you were saying, our proportions are different, um, or because we eat different foods culturally. It doesn't, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Um, but as far as like my role models growing up, I came to PNB and um, one of my teachers was a full Chinese man and he's from China. And he kind of opened my eyes, even though he's very classical and I'm more balanced in neoclassical, he opened my eyes to see that, oh, he he knows a lot, you know, he, he knows a lot about his body. He knows a lot about his his culture. He knows a lot about American culture and he's not even American. And the fact that he adapted and he's adapting students to the way he thinks, I think is so special. And it really changed my mental um, thought process of who could be in front of the room and who's teaching and who we can surround ourselves with. And it doesn't have to be the older white teacher anymore. You know, it could be, it could be people of color, you know, because that's what an American culture is. Um, so yeah, I just hope I could be a role model one day and not only for Asian people, for queer people as well. And yeah, just start making making a clear wider path for us to kind of grow in, in ballet. That's great. 
Um, I think Yuki is popping back in with some technical difficulties, but um, Christopher would love to hear about your experience of when you arrived at PNB, um, you know, be, suddenly being in an environment where there are other classical Asian dancers um, and not mm -hmm. sort of being the token one. What was that feeling like? Um, it kind of worried me a bit because I was like, okay, I have a lot more technique to brush up on, you know, like I just felt a greater sense of ambition. I was like, okay, there's more I can do. You know, I don't, I'm not just standing up because I'm the only one, but because my dance is different, because my artistry is different. I started seeing like how I could play a role in a ballet company versus as just being a body in a catalog of people. Um, so seeing other Asian dancers, at first I was intimidated and then I started talking to them and I was like, oh, I found a sense of comfort. I found a sense of home. I was like, okay, like they're just like me and they're from a different background as me, but they're still Asian Americans um, or Asians in general. And yeah, just, it became more of a comfort thing. I, I think I go up and talk to Asian dancers um, unconsciously, but they're kind of my go-to because it's it reminds me of family, I think. And having those people in the room helped me find my artistry more and helped me find a different dynamic in my dancing um, versus being a competition or putting us against each other. I think when we do that, it just, you create, that toxic ballet environment that why do we need that why can't we all just grow together but yeah i met yuki and i are close friends and we met and we kind of just instantly clicked and i think it's because we have similar journeys and we both graduated high school and came to pnb um, from new york to seattle so there are a lot of similarities in our path and i think we push each other as friends and artists and dancers too and we see each other in the studio and we're like hey, we can do this, you know, we got this. And it's just reassuring to have people that you feel like that um, with. I think it, it does give you comfort to, to grow and to take risks when you know that you've got other people who have your back and who aren't just either pigeonholing you or, or you know, typecasting you into a certain lane, um, but to really see you as an individual amongst lots of individuals. So I, I think we're, as we're pushing for more diversity, um, you know, with in our field, I think we're going to see a lot more of these experiences for for other dancers of color. Um, Yuki, Christopher, and I were just talking about sort of tokenism and being mm. like the one Asian versus being in a in a large community, a flock of Asians. Um, what, what was your experience when you when you came to P and B and you had um, suddenly all of these other Asian dancers around you, um, as opposed to being in the school where you looked around and you were the only one. It was, it felt comforting. It was like, yeah, I think comforting is the right word. It was like, let's go time, you know? Like um, in the school, I felt very isolated and alone sometimes. Um, and it was hard because it, on top of that, I was like, dealing with the whole visa stuff and like it was a hard time mentally too but then once I got into the company it was so relieving that when I got my contract I actually cried <laughs> in Peter's office because I was just like wow like this is this means so much to me um so yeah I think comforting is the best way I can put it so, yeah so thinking thinking from a constructive point of view as as two dancers who have gone through the American system, what are some suggestions you'd have for ballet schools to be more inclusive um, and to maybe make uh, the journey for uh, dancers of color, specifically Asians, to find success in their in their training? Chris. Christopher, Christopher, go ahead. Um, I think we can definitely not make this like taboo, like we can talk about this yeah, and we can have conversations that are talking about our 
our ethnicities and our heritage and it not be a big, you know, topic to, to undertake a big conversation to go through. I think kind of normalizing, talking about who we are and where we come from and the fact that we're different, we're all different, you know, nobody's the same. Um, highlighting diversity and not in a sense that it's like, this is a diverse group and this is the majority group. It's just kind of blending everything a little bit better. And that also includes involving um, your family and your parents and whoever is kind of the caretaker as a younger student, um, teachers may be talking to them and giving them comfort or just opening up a dialogue so that the family feels like there's a safe space for us young students, our young minds to grow in an institution that's very, that puts you in your lines, you know, puts you in your boxes. Um, so I think just opening up the dialogue and not making it a big thing, not making a fuss over it. Uh, I think that would help a lot if I were a younger student. Um, I think that would give me a lot more confidence and I think peace of mind. Um, so yeah, just opening it up a little bit more. Yeah. What about you, Yuki? The, the whole final bow for Yellow Face interviews, all of those, those conversations that I, I really watched all of them because it was, it interested me because I feel like it, it's never been done before really where Asians are given the space to speak on how they feel in this world. And so that helped a lot, like just talking about it, opening it up, like Chris said, and maybe even reaching down to the kids just for them to be able to connect with the dancers in the company who also look like them, you know, it's, it's a talk about it with the people around you and then reach down to the upcoming aspiring dancers. I think that connecting the worlds would really, really make a big difference. It creates so a community. It sounds like we're, we're both focusing on how do we in, include uh, the families of young dancers to make them feel welcome and part of the community. It sounds like we're talking about um, just a general comfort of talking about race in general, even from a young age with our students, our faculty. Um, and then also, Yuki, you bring up this idea of kind of mentorship. So how do we build bridges between the current professionals and students to show them what the path could be for them if they work as hard as you guys do? Um, so it sounds like those are three constructive um, solutions that I think um, can be broad enough to, you know, be applied to other groups of, of dancers of color too. So thank you for that. Um, would love to hear about your professional experiences as well. Um, you know, as you guys both mentioned, there's a lot of Asian dancers in Pacific Northwest Ballet. Um, has Have there been any situations where you feel like your race has affected casting either in a negative way, um, saying, oh, you're, you're not right for these roles because of the way you look, or the other side of saying, well, maybe we need to cast an Asian person in this role, so we're gonna put you in this role maybe before you're ready. Do you, do you find any, um, any of the, either of those dynamics have existed in your career? For me, I, never really felt that I was being typecasted in a role. Um, I've been in the company, this is my fourth year now, and we have a very diverse rep, you know, between classical ballets to uh, neoclassical to contemporary to new works. You know, we have a whole kind of catalog of dances and I never felt like I got something because of the way I looked um, from my heritage sense, the fact that I'm Asian but there was an interesting situation where one of the ballets was a, a tale, a Japanese tale, and I was not casted to do to perform it. I was second cast, but all the boys came in the dressing room and they all had features that were very Asian, you know, drawn out eyebrows and eyes and nostrils. And I, it was kind of a reverse of what you're saying. I was like, why am I not dancing then? Why am I not out there representing my culture when, you know, these people that are not Asian are? Why is that fair? Um, and then that made me question who who's getting to tell my story? Who's getting to tell my truth? And it just made me question a lot of things. And I was like, why is there not accurate representation if you're trying to represent something? If you're trying to tell a folk tale or story, use people that are from that. 
Um, so it was not typecasting at all. If anything, I was like, why can't I be showing and representing who I am more? Um, I think that was a good realization, but p and they've never really put me into any pigeonholes, um, which I'm very thankful for. And I'm too tall to do Chinese in the Nutcracker, to do tea in the Nutcracker. So I kind of got an escape there. Um, same. So I, <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the one, the one role I know each year is a little bit like, okay, let's see how this goes this year. And I luckily got to avoid that. Um, but I would love to represent my Chinese side as well. You know, that's not a bad thing by any means. Yeah. I think when we were talking earlier, we were also talking about the dynamic of just because something is Asian on stage doesn't necessarily mean it's an authentic, accurate portrayal. So even as an Asian dancer, um, if there is a role that's supposed to be an Asian person, but it was made by a non-Asian person, kind of not really authentic or really have integrity, is that still a role that you would want to dance as an Asian person um, versus, yep. say, having an Asian choreographer make something on you? You know, what what do you think that that I mean, how would that feel differently for you guys? I feel like if it was a situation like Raku where it, the choreographer is nothing of Asian descent, you know, it's a fantasy story, I guess. Um, I would feel, I would question why this is even a thing. You know, it's like, it's different to celebrate a culture and to respect it, but it's also another thing to fantasize about something and put it on stage and, you know. Um, so I was a student when Raku was on stage um, and I remember when I watched it, I enjoyed it because, you know, it was Nolani dancing on stage and I look up to her and I was able to pick out the beauty in it, but then I read the, the the director notes, you know, and about the piece. And then that's when I was like, oh, I don't, I don't really feel good about that. Um, especially because it was about Japanese um, culture and a story tale of that sort. So, what what made you what made you uncomfortable? I think it was that it was a was is he Russian? I can't remember. Yuri yeah, Yuri's Russian, yeah. You're yeah, off as the I think it's that part that it was like, so did you, did you research, you know, like what, why, like I just, I had a lot of questions about what was the, the purpose of it, because it wasn't really a, a happy story necessarily, you know, so. It, it might not have been how you would have portrayed Japanese culture on stage. At all, no. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's a, a common um, conversation that's happening outside of ballet too, in, in literary works, in, in uh, you know, other performing arts of um, asking creative people, asking themselves, am I the best person to tell this story? Um, and sometimes that answer is no. And then do I respect that answer or not? Uh, I think a, a, a lot of um, a lot of artists are inspired by other cultures and want to tell other stories and appreciate other stories. And um, the conclusion that I've come to is that um, inclusion is the antidote to appropriation. So say I'm not Japanese, but I wanted to tell a Japanese story. Mm. I might not just say, well, I read a book about Japan and that's good enough for me and good enough for this process. I would probably want to include some Japanese people who know the contours of the culture, where the paradoxes lie, um, where the symbols uh, lie to, to really help um, tell the story the way I want to tell it. So in, in this case, would, would the process have made you felt better if there were more, if there was Japanese collaborators working with Yuri to create? Yes, absolutely, like, you know, the music, if they collaborated to create something, it's like, that would have probably been a little bit better um, because the culture, there's so much history to it. It's like, you have to respect the history of it. and it's a part of people's identities as well. So you don't want to disrespect it. Yeah. You don't want to tell it the wrong way or incorrectly. It's like, 
I love it when people are into Japanese culture and it's like, I'm happy to talk about it and share about it and spread awareness because it's my being, <laughs> but don't take my words or don't take it from my, me. What's, what's the impact on you personally when you see a portrayal of Japanese culture that doesn't feel true or doesn't have integrity? How, do, how does that make you feel as a Japanese person? Well, it would feel like a scam. It's like, this is not accurate. This is not real. Where, where are you getting this information from? How, why are you sharing it to people when it's not accurate at all? Yeah. It's like a little bit offensive. You're like, it would I would be taken aback, just because. Would it Would it feel different if there were more Asian voices in the community making work? There were also Japanese, so then you have, you know, lots of different versions of Japanese-ness out there. Yes. Would that make a difference? I think it would be different. Yeah. I think it. The, what matters most is the source of what's being created. It's like, it doesn't really matter what race you are, but if you're going to talk talk about or create something about culture, I would hope you would include people from the original source, you know? Yeah. I think well, that it, just makes sense. It sounds like in general though, PNB has been a welcome place for Asian American dancers and that you guys are really feeling like um, you're able to achieve your full potential regardless of your racial background. So that's very uh, yes. reassuring to hear and very nice to hear. Um, are there ways that PNB might be, might still could do better in terms of how it represents Asian people either on stage or off stage? I think going back to what you're saying about having choreographers in the studio and having a more inclusive space, um, I think it's kind of a, my experience with choreographers as a professional dancer, um, you're not cued in on a lot as a dancer you're not given as much information as you would need to comprehend what you're doing um, story-wise, if it's a narrative. So I think from a choreographer, I think if you had as many people involved telling the story, sharing ideas and being open about it, I think that could create a better space too. I wonder what Yuri's intention was. I wonder if he had people in the studio creating with him and if he didn't, then why not? You know, why not open up the space and talk about your what you're thinking and your ideas? Because at the end of the day, the process is what really matters. Um, and then the product matters a lot. But to the dancers, to the artists involved, and to the story, the narrative, it's all about what's in the middle and how you create that middle phase. Um, so maybe PNB or a ballet institution could nudge their choreographers if they're going to make a narrative-based piece. Okay, are you, are you going to talk about this to the dancers? Are you going to talk about this to costume people? Are you going to bring people in to amplify the story and create some clarity? Um, it just feels like it feels like there's a little bit of distance between creator and interpreter, if you will, or dancer. Um, so maybe mending the gap and maybe PNB can just kind of give the choreographers a nudge and be like, Let's open this up, even for audiences too, creating dialogue with audiences and letting them ask questions before the show even started maybe, so they go into it with a better headspace. Yeah, I was, um, I was interviewing a, a choreographer named Emily Johnson. She's a First Nation choreographer. And she was talking about this idea of um, the sort of genius artist and it's like the choreographer goes into this space and it's private, it's secret, and makes this makes this dance, and we don't get to be, we don't get to see it. And the only time the art happens is when we all go into a room and sit facing the same direction and turn off all the lights. The art happens in that moment. That is the premiere, and then the lights come off and it's over, and we we walk away. Um, Emily was sharing with us that. Um, her practice is very different and her cultural practice is very different, that um, the process is also very important. So it's not a secret, it's collaborative, it's people from the community who aren't necessarily collaborators also getting to you know, have feedback. And so this idea of focus groups, which we use in other industries, 
um, we we can bring that to ballet too. You know, it's just that it's not the way we've done it historically. So we don't think that that's an option. Um, but so finding other ways to change our process and change our practice to be more inclusive as well. I think that's you're, you're touching on that. So um, I, I think that there there's a lot of pressure for us as a, a historical conservative art form to do things the way it has been done by the previous generation because it's been going on for 300 years. So there's some uh, commitment to history, um, but also we're in America. We're not, um, you know, we're not performing for the czar anymore. You know, the the audience is not nobility, Russian nobility. So it's it's people like you and me. So how do we change how we make the work to reflect who's actually in the audience? So I think that that our community is starting to ask ourselves some of those questions. Um, so within this context of, um, you know, including people of color, I think that's something we need to do a lot better of, of asking ourselves. Um, taking a step back and just zooming out to the broader dance world in general, how, what, what, what advice or constructive feedback would you give to our community in terms of how we can just be more inclusive in general? Are there aspects of how we do things that you guys think could be improved? Um, well, I think, again, just talking to audiences and maybe getting direct feedback, surveys, you know, seeing if they liked the gala, if they liked what it represented, if it represented everything clearly and with diversity, but not tokenizing diversity, you know, they felt comforted, um, kind of like Yuki and I were saying, if there's a safe space, you know, in this, in this theater, in this house, um, are we creating a space where anyone can come through the doors and feel respected? And I think just getting feedback from audiences and again, being um, honest as an organization that we can do better, that we will do better and we want to listen and we want to do more. Um, yeah, I think communication and honesty and getting the community's voice involved is probably one of the most crucial parts right now, especially in a pandemic, you know, is getting all these people on board for this journey um, in a classical art form in America. Uh, so, yeah, I think just getting audiences with us. Yeah, even these PN, this whole PMB is listening panel that's happening is a good step forward. I think it's opening up space for core dancers like us to speak up about our experience and it feels really great it's like i i've never really addressed any of this kind of these feelings that i've had so it's really nice to have a space to talk about it and i think that's a really really good step forward great yeah. um would love to fast forward into the future um say 50 years and in, into the future what do you guys think american ballet looks like Ooh. Um, I would hope that it would look like, uh, what's the word? I hope there's variety. I hope there's, and not just diversity in the people, but in the stories we're telling, in the forms of art, the mediums of art that we're telling them through. So it doesn't have to just be a pretty blue backdrop with white tights and point shoes. You know, it can be an abstraction of that that is representing a rainbow of people. Um, and it that'd be the norm, that not be like the big avant-garde piece. You know, that being every rep, you're gonna see one thing that's, at least one thing that's like that. Um, I would hope that just companies are a lot more diverse in who's dancing and who's in charge, who's the director um, male, female, trans, um, no matter what color you are, what your skin is, who you are, what you identify as, just having as much liberty to be who you are and have people want to progress that, people want to show that with you and push that. Um, yeah, our society, especially with iPhones right now, we're so caught up in images and the contrast of people 
how am I different from them? What do I have to offer? And I think it'd be nice if we all kind of just pushed each other to go higher and not saturate each other too much, you know? So I hope dance looks like that in, in America, at least. I would hope dance doesn't backtrack. Um, even in, because the, the pandemic, we've, I've seen a lot of digital dance that has been amazing. And I hope 50 years from now, that's become a normal thing. In addition to our stage performances, you know, it's like we want to go back to performing live for audiences, of course, but it would be super cool to see also visual arts in like media for and for ballet to spread that way and for dance to be come even bigger because um, there's just been so many creations virtually. I think that'd be super cool to for it to be a normal part of our what we do. I love that. I love I love the idea of ballet companies not being ballet companies, but instead more like content producers. Um, you know, you're you're making movies. It's VR. It's immersive spaces. It's also proscenium traditional, you know, programs. But at the heart of it is this physical discipline that came from the European courts, but now is so much bigger than anybody, you know, could have imagined. So I, I love I love that image. Um, so we'd love to leave our, our viewers with that idea, but also wanted to give them the chance to see both of you dance. So I know you guys have both been working in the studios on and off uh, during the pandemic. Um, what, what, what are some of the chances uh, for audience members to see you guys coming up? What's, what's next? What's being released? Next for me is Nutcracker. <laughs> what, what are you doing in Nutcracker? Uh, I'm going to be dancing marzipan but it's unclear what nutcracker is this year so i think we're still i'll be working on the variation in studios and such but um don't know where that'll go if it'll be filmed or you know i think all of that is still a lot of work to put together because we it's, it's so um unknown this we're in a pandemic so but that's what i'm working on next nutcracker. <laughs> We, uh, Yuki and I were both in Penny Saunders' new work um, that was premiering uh, the week of November 12th. Um, it's the second rep of our season. So we both were doing that, um, which was socially distanced in the theater. And Yuki was dancing in the, the orchestra pit and on stage, and I got to dance on stage as well. Um, so it's cool to do a work that is you know, conscious of the pandemic right now. And that's also new and fresh and innovative. Um, I'm dancing a Alejandro Cerruto solo in the gala. So I'm really excited about that um, to Dean Martin music. And yeah, I think Donald Bird's piece is coming up too, um, which is an all male cast. And that'll be really fun. He's a great choreographer to work with and a great mind to kind of pick. Um, so yeah, well, we have a lot of new content coming out this season and some archival classical works like Romeo and Juliet. So it'll be, it'll be a mixed rep between old and new and everything in between. So. Well, I can't wait to, uh, to, to watch it myself. And I, I hope all the people who are tuning into this conversation are also equally excited. Um, just wanted to thank Yuki and Christopher again for your honesty um, for sharing your stories with us and for giving us a glimpse into what it's like being an Asian professional dancer. Also wanted to remind everybody who's uh, listening at home that the pandemic has been especially rough for those of us in the performing arts and we need your support right now more than ever. Um, so if you are, if you're a big fan of PNB, you want them to continue to produce great work um, and be a pillar of the community in Seattle. Uh, I highly encourage those of you who have the means to please give generously uh, to PNB and help keep these amazing artists working and adapting uh, through these challenging times. So Yuki and Christopher, thank you so much again. Thank you to Pacific Northwest Ballet for hosting this series. Um, I think it's incredibly courageous. So, um, and thank you to everybody tuning in. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.